Thank you for joining us for today's message. We are always so encouraged to hear how God is using Adventure Church to speak into your life. If you would like to support Adventure Church financially, you can do so online and help us bring messages just like this one to you each and every week. Now let's prepare our hearts to hear a word from God. So I'm excited to be back. We're in the series, as Ryan said, called Hall of Fame. And today I'm going to talk to you about Elijah. Look at your neighbor and say, Eli. Ja, okay? You had to say Ja with a J, not with an S. Elisha was Elijah's replacement prophet when he left this earth. And uh, we're going to be talking about Elijah today. And in this series, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, we've been looking at some of the people there. And uh, we've had some people going, hey, we've been talking about people that weren't listed in Hebrews 11. And first of all, I want to say thank you for reading Hebrews chapter 11. You're listening to me. Uh, but we're, we're, we're not just tied to that, uh, the list that, that the author of Hebrews laid out for us. We're looking at some other characters in Scripture uh, that we feel that we can learn a lot from. And today I want to talk to you really about one of my favorite Old Testament characters, Elijah, and it means the Lord is my God, which was important at that time because what was happening is God's people were straying from just worshiping Yahweh, uh, the one true God, and they began to worship false idols. So Elijah, a little bit about his background, he was an influential prophet who lived in 9th century BC during the reign of King Ahab and Hazaya in northern kingdom of Israel, okay? And during this time, God would speak through his prophet. He would anoint a prophet, and they would be God's voice to his people. And so God would speak to him, and then they had to have the boldness and the courage to step out and to tell the people what God was speaking to them. And oftentimes, it wasn't nice stuff. And Elijah was really one of these prophets who didn't hold back. And he began to call God's people out for worshiping false idols. And even to this day, he has kind of shaped uh, history and has a lasting impact on the way Israel thinks and, and for centuries afterwards, really. Uh, so he was very influential. He emphasized the unconditional loyalty to God and to not stray to worship idols. Uh, Elijah opposed the accepted standards of his day when the belief in many gods was normal, much like today. Uh, we worship a lot of idols. We may not call them gods, but we worship a lot of things, right? Come on. Our careers, uh, our finances, our children. Come on, I'm really hitting someone there, right? Where we worship a lot of things, where we give more to things and people other than God. And so Elijah stood against King Ahab, who was the king at the time, and his wife Jezebel. How many of you heard of Jezebel before? At least you've heard her reference. You're like, That's a Jezebel lady. You don't want to be called Jezebel. Let me just say that. Uh, if, you, if anyone ever calls you Jezebel, it's not a good thing. And so Elijah was standing against King Ahab. He followed God, but he married a woman who did not follow God. And so Jezebel was a very evil woman, and they began to worship this false god called Baal. And as punishment against Ahab for building a temple to worship Baal, Elijah predicted that a drought would grip the land, and it did. And so for three and a half years, it did not rain, and uh, Ahab gets really mad because it was hurting their economy, their crops, all of that stuff, and so he, he f- kind of flees uh, his wrath, and during that time, God is very faithful to him, and he's fed by ravens. Of the air, birds come every morning and bring him food. How many of you think that would be a nice, you know, like today, like God just set up some drone to just bring you your breakfast every morning, right? And so that's what's happening with Elijah. Uh, And then eventually he kind of, that stops and the stream he's at dries up. And then he goes to uh, this widow's house and God provides miraculously through this widow and keeps providing food. And then after three years of drought, the Lord instructed Elijah to quit hiding and to go confront King Ahab. And so he's on his way to confront him. And that is when we have the showdown on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. Okay, so they begin to worship this God of Baal. All these people begin to become prophets of Baal, they would call it that. And Elijah calls out King Ahab and Jezebel and these prophets, and he says, Here's what we're going to do we're going to build an altar, and you're going to call on your God, Baal. And whichever God answers our prayer with fire from heaven, that's the God that everyone's going to worship. And so it's 1 verse 450, right? There's some courage there. And I want to tell you this. Sometimes God's going to call you to do something that's going to require some risk. 
Sometimes we, we make this mistake that, that following Jesus is easy, that it's going to be comfortable. And I think if anything we're learning throughout this Hall of Fame series is that it's not. That, that God's going to call you to do things that are going to stand in contrast to the values of our world, to the way that you've thought, to the way that you've lived. He's going to call you to step out of your comfort zone, to embrace new things, to try new things. And I just want to tell you that today. Risk is required, but I always like to say with, where there's no risk, there's no reward. And so Elijah takes a big risk. And so the prophets of Baal, uh, you should read the, the story. It's an awesome one in 1 Kings 18. Uh, and he, they call down all day long. They're, they're praying, they're, they're doing all these things, and they're slashing themselves and sacrifice all the trying to get Baal, who was not God, as we know, to send fire from heaven. Elijah was bold, and he, he begins to taunt them, and he goes, maybe you should shout a little louder. Maybe your God's a little hard of hearing. He actually even goes and says, maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's in the bathroom and he just, he's just not paying attention. Why don't you dance a little bit more and see what happens? Well, they do this for 12 hours and nothing happens. So then Elijah steps out. He goes, all right, you guys, you've had your turn. Now it's my turn. And it says that he builds the altar back up. And then just to make sure there's no tricks or gimmicks, he dumps water all over the, the wood that the fire is going to come down. And then it says after he does that, he simply comes out and prays and says, God, I know you're God. Show these people you're God. And fire falls from heaven and consumes up all the wood. And these people, obviously, if you were there standing in attendance, are in awe. They begin to think, oh, that is the true God. And it amazes me that these people did all of this stuff, right? These prophets of Baal, they were doing all this crazy stuff, trying to get God to answer them, their God to answer them. And all Elijah did was pray. That was it. Today, I think Elijah would tell us this too. Risk is going to be required, but listen, prayer is powerful. In fact, Jesus' brother James references Elijah's faith and the power of his prayer in James chapter 5, 16 through 18. It says this, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power, produces wonderful results. Elijah was human as we are, yet when he prayed, that's important. He says, look, Elijah's just like me and you. And sometimes when we read these stories and we reference these, these people of, of the Old Testament and New Testament, these heroes of our faith, these Hall of Famers, we think that they're something special. They did something special, but they were just like you and me. They were human, just like you and me, born of a, of a natural birth, of, had a mom and dad, had a brothers and sisters. These were this. He says, so Elijah was human, just like you and me, yet... When he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. So here is Elijah, this prophet. He's taking risks for God. He's stepping out in faith. He's, he's a man of prayer and power. And today, this is where we're going to pick up his story in 1 Kings chapter 19. And so all of this happens, all of these 450 prophets of Baal that were trying to get fire to fall down didn't happen, and when God sent fire, they killed these prophets of Baal. The people turned on them, they killed them, and so Ahab goes home and tells his wife. That's what happens. He goes and tells Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 19, it says, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. Verse 3, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. To me, this is just so ironic. This man had performed many miracles already, and he had literally, just the day before, called down fire from heaven, and God answered, and God killed all these people who were worshiping him. That was the day before. I don't know about you, but I would have been walking out like, what's up? What? Jezebel? What you going to do? I just killed 450. I have no problem handling you. Come on out. But that's not what it says happened, is it? It says Elijah was afraid. 
Elijah began to go on the run. He's running for his life in fear. He wasn't running for his life. He was running from his life. And I don't think Elijah was probably afraid that he would die. I think Elijah had just reached the place where he was kind of burnt out. He was going, I've done all this stuff, God, and yet here's another problem. I just did this. I just took the hugest, biggest risk of my life. I, I faced down 450, 450 to 1. The odds were not in my favor. Thank you for answering, God. But isn't enough enough? I think that's where he was at. He was tired. He was worn out. And today I want to tell you this. Maybe you've been faithful to God too. Maybe you've been doing what God has called you to do. And, and it just seems like no matter what you do, there's still another problem waiting. There's still another issue that you have to get over. There's still another thing that you have to somehow figure out how you have to overcome. And I think Elijah would say to you today, I've been there. I know what it feels. And he was worn out in this time too. He calls down fire from heaven, but I think that Elijah had got his focus off of God and onto his problem again. You see, a lot of times we think to be risk takers, to be like Elijah's, that, that we have to be fearless. And I would say that that's impossible because you're human. There's going to be times when you are afraid, just like Elijah, that you know that God's done some great stuff in your life, but there's still fear there. And I would say this, that faith isn't the absence of fear, but it's a stronger trust in God despite the fear that we are currently feeling. And Elijah would say, look, it's okay to be afraid, but don't go on the run. Learn, learn from me. Don't run. So it goes on, we, we pick up the story, we continue there in verse 5, it says that then he, he laid and slept under this broom tree, but as he was sleeping, an angel of the Lord touched him and told him, get up and eat. Look at your neighbor and say, get up and eat. Come on, that's a good thing, right? Someone wakes you up in the morning and says, get up and eat. And it says, he looked around and there beside him, his head was some bread baked on hot stones in a jar of water. Again, God bringing him the food that he needs, so he ate and drank. Then he laid down again. Then the angel of the Lord came and touched him again. He said, get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up, he ate, and he drank. The food he gave him was enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long trip. God gave him exactly what he needed. He traveled to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, and there he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here Elijah, what are you doing here? So Elijah's about to quit. He's had all this faith. He's worn out. He's burnt out. He's on the run. He's fleeing. And sometimes our strongest human courage and the faith that we have is, is still a limited resource. It's still not enough. And Elijah, again, wasn't afraid of death. He was just tired. He was worn out. And so an angel is sent on behalf of God and tells him to get up and eat this journey is too much for you, but it's not too much for me. And he's being reminded of what God did in the past. Remember when those ravens, when I could, sent some birds to, to do this? I sent even better this time. I sent an angel. <laughs> they whipped you up a nice meal while you were asleep. And he's reminding him of his faithfulness. Don't forget what I did for you. Don't forget what I've done for you. I, I got you, Elijah. You may feel like you're alone, but you're not alone. And God supplied the strength that he needed through the word of the angel. that The angel came and supplied the strength that he needed. Today, it's the same thing. It's, it's a little bit different. This angel was sent to encourage him. And today, I want to tell you this, that every day, you need to get up and eat of God's word. God's word is our source of strength. Scripture says it's the bread of life. It's it's, it's what sustains us. And I'm telling you, when you're on a spiritual journey, there's going to come times where you feel like you're worn out. And God sent an angel and sent some food and said, listen, don't forget, I am your source of strength. You can't do this alone, Elijah, and I'm not asking you to do it alone. I am your source of strength. And here's the amazing thing for us, that we don't, God doesn't have to send angels. How many of you would like it if you woke up and an angel was there and saying, hey, good morning, get up, eat, I've made you breakfast, right? That'd be really nice. I'd be really encouraged. I'd be like, okay, yeah, I got this. This is awesome. Thank you, angel, for that. But here's the deal. We don't need angels anymore because we have the word of God. We have the, the direct word of God 
at available to us. And, and today we have it on our phones that no matter where we go, we have the, the strength that we need, the word of God. And when life is too much for you, you need the bread of life. You daily need to get up and eat of God's word. And today, if you feel burnout, you feel spiritually malnourished, I'm telling you, you're going to be susceptible to the schemes of the enemy if you don't begin to eat of the word of God. I think Elijah would tell you that our power to live the life that God called us to live comes from God's promises, which are written all throughout his words. The proclamation of God's promises, proclaiming them, is what feeds our faith and will starve our fears. You see, a lot of times we we talk about this throughout Scripture where we say it's that our thoughts dictate our life. Proverbs says the way you think, I mean, it determines the outcome of your life. And, And I totally agree with that, that we need to think positive, that we don't dwell on the negative, but we dwell on the promises of God and we begin to learn them by eating of God's word. We know what he says. That's what we were singing this morning, right? God, I know you're for me, not against me. I am who you say I am, not who what I feel that I am, not what others say that I am. I am who you say I am. You're for me, not against me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am, right? That is proclaiming a promise of God for your life. Even when you don't feel it, you proclaim that spiritual truth, but the scriptures say that you can't just think it, that you literally have to speak it. That the power comes not just from knowing it, but speaking it out in your life. There's a thing, I taught on this about a year and a half ago here through our noise series, and uh, I talked about how Every day I start my day with spiritual truths. It's the promises of God for me. And I don't just read them. I audibly speak them out. I say things like this, that God, you have equipped me to lead. And even when I feel like I can't lead, I know that you are with me, that your spirit empowers me to be all that you've created me to be. God, I thank you for my wife, that she's a blessing from God. She's a treasure. God, help me to serve her today, to love her. I thank you for my kids and how amazing they are and the joy it is to be their dad. God, help me to lead them so that they will know you and pursue your plan for your life. I thank you for Adventure Church. This isn't something I have to do. It's something I get to do. God, what a joy it is to serve you through the local church. These are the truths that I speak to myself. Let me just tell you something. I don't always feel that way. I don't always feel that my kids are a blessing from the Lord. I always feel that my wife is. But not my kids. God, they are possessed. I rebuke them in the name of Jesus. Get them far from my presence so that I can move forward in faith, right? I don't always feel that, but I speak that truth. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is laying out your armor for spiritual battle. And here's the key that you got to know, that we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against these principalities of darkness in the spiritual world, a world that's unseen to, the, to, our, to our eyes, to our human eyes. But the Bible says that there is a spiritual battle that is waging for your soul, that the enemy is trying to do everything he can to pull you from the path and the plan that God has for your life. And so Paul lists out all the armor for for battle that we have to dress ourselves with every day and then it says this in addition to all of these things that he's already listed he says hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God the word of God the promises of God there's three different meanings of the word of God in the original Greek language which was written in the New Testament. First is graphe, which literally means the writings, the physical form of the book. So you'll hear the, the, the graphe word of God. Then you have the logos or logos, if you want to say how you want to say it, is the message given from the graphe. So the word was written, and it's not just the words that matter. There's a message within the scripture that speaks to us and gives us direction for our life. It's the meaning of the writing. And then there's the rhema word of God, which is the uttered or spoken, declared word of God. And in this instance, in Ephesians 5, 17, where he says, when you're in battle, when you're on the run, when you feel like you're worn out, it's not just knowing the word of God. It's not just reading the word of God. It is declaring the word of God that is the sword that fights back the enemy who is waging war against your life. It's the spoken word. And you may feel a little weird sometimes, but I'm just telling you, you need to put this to practice in your life. You need to begin to declare audibly 
And I'm not saying in the middle of Walmart, maybe sometimes you need to in the middle of Walmart. Lord, I, I speak more cash ears in the name of Jesus, right? <laughs> Fill these aisles. I don't know why they have 30 and there's only two people working, but in the name of Jesus, I pray in faith for more people to work at Walmart. No, uh, not that kind of work. But in your life, you're driving to work, whatever it may be, you're getting ready to go into a meeting, whatever it is, you find a place where you can verbally, audibly declare the promises of God for your life. You are for me. You're not against me. God, you are with me. You will never leave me. God, you will give me the strength. We need to speak out because the spoken word is the sword that you get for spiritual warfare. It's your sword. And you can have the word with you. It can be strapped it can be on your phone. It can be in your pocket. You can have the word with you all the time, but until you pull the word out and begin to use the word of God the way Paul gives us instruction to, you're not going to fight anything back. You have to declare the word of God, the truth. So Elijah is given a word from God. He's speaking, the angel is speaking to him, and then this is how he responds in verse 10. He says, Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. Here's the thing, too. Elijah said this, so this is how he must have felt. This is what he thought. But he wasn't the only one left. God had preserved others who had not bowed their knee to Baal. But Elijah didn't know that. He wasn't alone, even though he felt alone. And today, I want to tell you that, too. I think Elijah would say, even when you feel alone, you're not alone. One, I can tell you this, there's always a church who's for you too, who loves you, who will surround you, who will lift you up, who will walk with you when you go through hard times. That's why it's so important. I tell people all the time, I was counseling with someone this week, life groups, why you need to get in a life group is because they're preventative. They're, they're there if you don't go to one now when you don't need it, it won't be there when you do need it. And I'm just telling you that there's people in groups that they're going through difficult times and guess what? They have people to call to pray for them. They have people who will show up and bring them meals when something goes wrong. They have a group of people who will keep them accountable when they begin to stray from God's path and go, where have you been? Why are you not here? How come you're not showing up to group anymore? How come you haven't been at church? Where have you been? What's going on in your life? And Elijah obviously wasn't in a life group because he's on the run by himself. He's alone. He's afraid. He's complaining right now. He says, I'm the only one left. He goes, and now they're trying to kill me too. And this is what God says to him. He says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after there was a fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. So Elijah comes out of the cave. God says, get out of the cave. Go out and just stand. Just stand there. Watch me. Don't forget who I am. I know you called down fire, but you've obviously forgotten who I am. And he begins to send wind that is strong enough to blow rocks off of a mountain. He begins to shake the earth. He begins to send fire again. And I think Elijah is being reminded of the power of God. But it says in all of those things, God wasn't in there. That it was a whisper, a gentle whisper. And it said, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he would out and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and the voice said this, again, in a whisper, Elijah, what are you doing here? Why are you here? What good is this cave? Why are you running? And he gives him two instructions. The first one, he says, go out and stand. And I think Elijah would tell you this today. When you want to run, when you want to go on the run for your life, when you want to run away from your problems, you want to run away from your marriage, you want to run away from the issues that you're facing, he says, stop running, stand still, and remember God's faithfulness. That's what God was doing. He was reminding him of his faithfulness. He was reminding him of his power. He goes, look, I haven't changed, Elijah. Why are you running? Psalm 46.10, we know that from the Hall of Fame series, we talked about David, and David was on the run for a lot of his his tenure as king, and he's fleeing from his life, and Saul's trying to kill him, his son's trying to kill him, all this stuff is happening, and David wrote in Psalm 46.10, he said this, be still and know that I am God. Just be still and remember who I am. Remember the power that I have, and I'm telling you, when you feel like you need to run, Elijah would say, stop, do not run, 
just stand still and remember the faithfulness of God. And he looks at Elijah and he says, Elijah, he whispers to him, what are you doing in here? Why are you here? Why are you in this cave? As I was preparing for this this week, I I couldn't help but think of that soccer team in Thailand. Those 12 boys, I think it was 12, and their coach, or maybe there was more, that were stuck in this cave. And I was thinking about, one, I'm, I'm not like claustrophobic. I don't get freak out in tight spaces or anything like that. But I would have a hard time swimming through a very tight space holding my breath to get out. Right? And I was thinking about what it would feel like to be in a cave, some of them, for 17 days. And the thing that I thought about that would be the worst to me would be the absence of light. There's no light. I'm sure may, maybe some of them had some cell phones. Maybe the coach had a cell phone. I don't know what it was. But there, there was no light. And they were in there for 10 days before they found them. So for 10 days, they are in complete and total darkness. No light. I thought, man, how terrible would that be? So uh, Elijah goes into this cave. And when you're in a cave, it's dark. There's no light. And God says to Elijah, what is this accomplishing? Why are you in here? What is being in this cave going to do? What is worry going to do for you? How is hiding going to help your problem? Is this really how you want to spend your time? In a dark cave? Because listen, in a dark cave, you can't see me. So God tells him, get out of the cave. What are you doing here? Get out. And some of you today, maybe you've been on the run. That there's issues in life and there's things that you're facing. Instead of facing them head on, you've been running and hiding. And maybe today you're in a cave of fear where you're hiding under the covers because you're just afraid to face reality. It's what Elijah was doing. And listen, you may delay it, but denial, that's all it does is delay. It doesn't change the inevitable. You still have to face whatever you have to face. Maybe today you're in a cave of disappointment. There's failed expectations. Life isn't how you thought it would be and how you wanted it to be. And so you've been stuck in a cave of disappointment. Maybe it's a cave of shame where you just can't seem to move past your past. And you know that God's forgiven you, but you can't forgive yourself. Maybe you're in a cave of doubt. Can God really come through? Is God who he really says he is? Is he really for me? Maybe you're in a cave of worry and financial issues that you're facing. There's some health problems that you're trying to overcome. Your marriage is in disarray. Your children have, have wandered from the truth and your career is in turmoil. There could be layoffs or whatever it may be that you've, you've, you've kind of shriveled back in fear and you've found yourself in this cave. And I think today God would say the same thing to you that he said to Elijah. What are you doing here? Remember who I am. Elijah would say, listen, the cave will not help you. It's temporary relief. Whenever you come out of the cave, whatever you need to face is still going to be there. It's not going to go away just because you try to hide. And today I would tell you, if you're in a cave, get out of the cave. Come into the light of God's presence. He is for you. He is not. He, he is with you. But I would say in order... To step out, you got to make sure that you can hear the whisper. God's not going to shout. You know who shouts? The enemy. You know what shouts? Your fear, your doubts, your past. That stuff screams in your face. And God goes, if you want to hear me, you got to get close to me. Proximity is essential to experiencing the presence of God. You have to make a choice to come out of the cave and come into the presence of God. The Bible says it throughout Scripture, draw close to me and I will draw close to you. If you seek me, you'll find me. I'm here, but you got to get close to hear me. you got to silence the noise of your life. you got to turn off your phone, turn off your computer, get away from your kids. Find a place where you can get alone with me and hear the voice of God. Amen. He will speak to you. He'll whisper his truth. He'll reassure you that he's with you. You see, in the Old Testament, it said that when he stepped out, that the Spirit passed by, that God was in the wind, that he, he was in the fire, that he passed by. And today, I want you to know this, because of Jesus and the cross, guess what? The Spirit doesn't pass by anymore. The Spirit is in you. 
Romans 8 says that he is in you, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, right? That kind of power is always available to you if you choose to tap into that power. The spirit of God is within you. That's the amazing gift that the Holy Spirit brings us, that we can have the power, that we can walk in faith, that we can trust God, that we can come out of our fear and out of our dysfunction and begin to walk with the power of God, sustained by his word. For me, i got to do that every day. With the future of Adventure Church kind of looming and, and trying to figure out what's next and moving to three services, and I may get up here and, and, and preach a good game, but I'll just, I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes I go, God, what are we going to do? Another service? Three services? God, we still don't have enough people to fill the, the, the spots and and. And are, are, are you sure if we go to three services that people are going are gonna to keep coming? <laughs> that there's still new people that, that want to come here? Maybe we should just stay in two. Maybe we should just stay in two. That'll be easier for everybody, God. Right? I have those moments. And, and I go, God, land has quadrupled in value since we started our church. Can you send a recession <laughs> that doesn't affect anyone in our church? but that will make land more affordable for our church. That I have these moments of doubt and fear, and I go, God, do you know what you're doing? And I'll have to do what I'm telling you to do, or I'll have to just get alone with God. And I'll go, hey, Kyle, remember when you moved here and you had no idea where the church would meet? I go, yeah, I remember that. And remember how I miraculously provided the Nationwide Hotel and Conference Center that you didn't even do anything, and I just handed it to you, and it was half the price that you were going to pay for the place that you were trying to get the church to meet. You remember that? Yeah, I got to remember that. Okay. And then remember when you were a year and a half in, and, and this building became available, and you were going to need to raise over twice or half of your annual budget in about three months and complete the whole renovation, and you almost died in the process, but do you remember that I, <laughs> that I did it? that you had more money in savings when you opened this building than when you started. Do you remember that, Kyle? Yes, Scott, I remember that. Okay. And then do you remember when you went from one service to two service and how I provided? And do you remember how every year after year that I've been bringing new people and the harvest keeps coming? And Yes, God, I remember. And God will remind me and he'll show me and he'll whisper to me, Kyle, get out of the cave. Get, get back in the game. There's still more work to do. But this time, don't go alone. Go with me. I'm with you. I got this. The band's going to come. We're going to close out. Today, I think Elijah would finish with this final thought. He would say, listen, no matter what you feel, no matter where you are, God is faithful to finish what he started. God had promised Elijah that he was going to use him. God had used Elijah in mighty ways, and Elijah thought it was over. He went on the run. He went and sat down and he said, God, take me out. I'm tired. I'm done with it. I'm over it. I can't do another battle. He flees and he runs away and God meets him where he's at. Listen, today I'll tell you this. You can run, but you can't hide from God. You can keep running if you want, but it's just going to wear you out. And maybe you found a cave and you've been sitting there for a while. And God's whispering the same thing to you that he said to Elijah. What are you doing in here? What's this going to accomplish? Get out of the dark. Come into the light. Remember my truth. Remember that I'm with you. And that I'm faithful to finish what I started. You see, in verse 14 of chapter 19, it says that Elijah again goes back to his default. Same thing he told the angel. I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. He's still in this mindset that I'm the only one left. And this is the Lord finally just has enough. He says, listen, Elijah, go back the way you came. What does that mean? You got to go back and face whatever you were running from. You got to go back the same way you came. Not just come out of the cave. Go back to where you came from. Travel through the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be the king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, Meloha, to replace you as my prophet 
Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu, and anyone who escapes Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. And this is what God was saying. Elijah, go back. And even if you fail, guess what? If he can't do it, I got someone else lined up. I got this. Get back to work. I'm not finished yet. I will be faithful to finish what I started as long as you don't quit and throw in the towel. So go back where you came. Face your fear. Get out of the cave of doubt. Get out of the cave of shame. Get out of the cave of disappointment. Get out of the cave of worry. Get out of the cave. Come into my light. Remember that I'm with you. Walk in faith. Walk in my power. Proclaim the truth of God. And I will be faithful to finish what I started. That's God's promise for you today. If you're tired, if you're worn out, if you're burnt out, and you just don't think you can make it, I think Elijah would say, get back to work. And it says that God's plan is still in place, is what he was telling them. My plan is still in place. I'll be faithful to finish what I started. And then verse 19, 19a, chapter 19, verse 19, it says, so Elijah went. He got back to work. And God did exactly what he said he was going to do. You see, Elijah had to get over his fear. He had to go back and face what he was running from. And I think, Elijah, if we were to say one final thought, how would you, what would you encourage the people of Adventure Church worth today? And he would say this, when you're afraid, like I was, because I was afraid. When you're afraid, proclaim God's promises. Be still in God's presence. Remember who he is and move forward in his power move forward. That's what faith does. It's not the absence of fear. God's people aren't fearless, but they somehow through God's strength and through his power find the ability to overcome their fear and to move forward in faith. And when you do that, God shows up in big ways. Would you stand with me today? And as we close out and sing this song together, I just want to encourage you Maybe God's saying to you, what are you doing in here? Remember where I brought you from. Remember what I saved you from. Remember my faithfulness in the past. And I'll be faithful again to do in the future. But get out of the cave. Quit running. Quit hiding. Face it. You got to face it. But you're not facing it alone. Despite what you feel, you are not alone. I am with you. There's a church that's with you. There's a group of people who will support you. And no matter what you face, I'll be faithful to finish what I started. God, today, remind us of who we are in you, that we are your child, that we don't have to be a slave to fear because of what you've done for us, that the Spirit of God resides in each and every one of us. And if we choose to tap into that power, God, I know that we can overcome anything. So I pray in these closing moments, Holy Spirit, do only what you can do and reassure us that you are with us, that you are for us, and that we will move forward in faith. In Jesus' name.